afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. And for anyone watching online, welcome to you too as well. I do now have a little bit of juice in my phone for anyone who has just seen my tweet saying I might not be able to tweet very much. So if you are watching online and you do have a question, feel free to tweet it through. Uh, normal uh, housekeeping applies. Please, if you've got devices, make sure they're on silent. And we'd love you to tweet. Um, the hashtag is tomorrowtech. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce our penultimate um, seminar of the term. Um, Dr. Ingmar Posner is an associate professor in information engineering here at the university and a tutor in engineering science at Pembroke. And he's going to focus his talk today on driverless cars, automated um, futures of, of, of transport. So how the technology behind driverless cars is designed and implemented. So without further ado, over to you, Ingmar. Okay. Um, okay. Um, hello. Thank you very much for having me. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, the audience size seems to be such that actually we could make that a bit of a conversation if you like. So at any point, if you have a question, just shout out and it makes it more of an interaction, which is good. I think we also have the time for that. Um, Can I just add something to that? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, do what she says. <laughs> all right, okay, all right. Um, good, so if you had asked me um, about five years ago what I'm most excited about, uh, I would have talked about this. This is the Oxford robot car. Uh, it is something that rather unusually for a research group, uh, my colleague Paul Newman and I paused the entire group for, for about four months, took up a, a forecourt from a dealership, um, basically automated and sent out as the Oxford robot car. It's the first self-driving car in the UK. Uh, until very recently, it was the only self-driving car that was licensed to go onto UK roads. Uh, it has given rise to, well, we, we like to believe that it's been instrumental in making robotics one of the eight great technologies announced in 2012. And certainly a lot of the um, procedure underlying that vehicle is now part of the code of conduct for autonomous vehicle testing in the UK. So we're pretty proud of that thing. If you ask me today, what I'm most excited about. It's probably more something like this, which is similar in sort of flavor. So what we have here is basically a um, sort of uh, more personalized transport system, which isn't necessarily road going. It operates on pavements. It's a two-seater pod. Uh, it's part of what's known as the Lutz project. Uh, I don't know, has anybody here heard of the, the Lutz project in Milton Keynes, pods in Milton Keynes? No? Okay, a couple of people. Um, all right, so there's a bunch of pods that go around Milton Keynes. Uh, and we'll go around Milton Keynes. The Lutz project is a prototype system of three pods. And the idea is that you can get in there, say, at the train station or at the shopping center or wherever, uh, and the vehicle will take you autonomously uh, along predefined routes around the environment. And the work that my colleagues and my group are doing is basically provide the entire autonomy stack for those systems. And very much that is an evolution of what the robot car did in the following way. If we want to really understand the corner cases for where this technology fails, we need to get it out in the field. And in order to get it out in the field, ideally 24 seven, if we can with as much contact time as we possibly can, then what's better than a low energy sort of environment to do that with. If you try that immediately at 120 miles an hour on some ideally German motorway, uh, then you may have some problems with that. But that sort of environment is really, really, really good. And so the technology that actually went into the robot car has been put together, has now evolved into an end-to-end -end sort of autonomy stack, which is called Selenium. And that's a pretty remarkable piece of software because it starts with uh, the raw sensor data that goes into it, and it goes up through the navigation of the vehicle, where am I, and I'll talk about that, through the perception by the vehicle, what's around me, through the planning of the, uh, of the vehicle, how do I actually act and interact with the world, um, all the way up through the control, through the safety, to the iPhone app that actually lets you summon the vehicle. And that is basically what will be driving those pods. That is what also will be driving one of uh, the successors of those pods, which is a 40 pod based PRT system in Milton Keynes. Uh, it underlies the Gateway project, which is a similar sort of thing seeing pods deployed in Greenwich. And of course, it underlies several trials that we do in the automotive domain, as in here with the Oxford robot car. So we're very, very excited about this. And the thing that you see on the left there is basically the iPad, and you see it down here as well, is the iPad that is the only device that the driver needs to interact in terms of going into autonomy. So that's where that is at. But why, 
why bother? I mean, this is kind of the, the icing on the cake. This is where we're at now. Oh, I should, I should say this. All right. So um, I've, I've talked about that. That's fine. Unfortunately, today we'll only have a couple of, um, we'll only have time to talk about a couple of these points, which is mainly about where am I the navigation and some of the perception bits. Uh, though I could spend days talking about lots of stuff. Why bother? Always a good question to ask. So we can be bold, we're academics. So we say, actually, we believe transport is pretty broken. Anybody who commutes into Oxford in the morning and commutes out of Oxford in the evening or afternoon, which I suspect are quite a number of us, will probably agree with that. Um, we don't think that we're condemned to a future in traffic jams. How much money do you think the UK economy loses on traffic jams, on balance? 10 billion. 10 billion? OK. More or less 10 billion? More. Somebody says more, yeah. I mean, it's my time alone, right? But uh, it's about 20 billion per year. <laughs> Figures are about three years old. How much money do you think the UK economy invests into care for the vulnerable? Hmm? 500. It's actually also of the order of 20 billion. It's kind of commensurate. So it makes you think we can probably do better things with that money, right? So we believe modern robotics very much lies a heart to that particular uh, of a solution to that particular problem. Okay, so a couple of considerations that we might, might want to make. First of all, must I always be in control? Well, um, I wouldn't be standing here if I thought the answer to that was no. So, um, or yes, for that matter. So uh, it's actually going to be a mix between the two, and that's maybe a surprising thing. But uh, must I always be in control? Probably not. Why can't I email or Skype? Uh, or program or negotiate if you do that sort of thing um, or think when I'm in traffic jam uh, are the roads really full so the estimates out there that say actually we could probably double or treble the capacity of the existing road network just by automating the vehicles interesting point don't know whether that's true interesting point why can only the able drive and I think if I went through that list um, that's probably my favorite one Right? So uh, I've got a friend who is very uncomfortable driving at night. He's a very you know, perfectly good driver, just doesn't like driving at night because he feels he's not really in control of what he's seeing. Um, does that make him unable to drive? I don't know. But I think certainly part of that technology and part of the solutions that we see in this technology will help us redefine what it means to be able to drive. And that I th personally, I find that very, very exciting. And lastly, why are we actually insuring against human error? That seems like an odd thing to do. So um, there's some people out there who believe that the time will come when we, looking back, will find it insane that ever we let humans drive vehicles. Do I agree with that? Not necessarily, but these kind of views are out there. Okay. Um, what it boils down to, though, is this. We're ultimately all short on time, and to be honest, we're all pretty bad at driving. Okay, so um, hmm, where do we go from here? Well, first of all, we re realize that it's not just about the technology, but it's about safety, it's about access, it's about efficiency, which sounds a bit boring, but it's true, but also it's about quality of life. And so these sort of societal issues, we also touch with that sort of technology, and that's quite important. So technology, which is very close to my heart in terms of a technology enthusiast, is only part of the story. We also have to help shape policy that's really quite important. How do we test these systems? How do we ensure they're safe? Uh, and society. Big word here is trust. And you know we talk about cybersecurity a lot, which is very, very important. Um, but what it boils down to is trust. So who here would get out and get into an autonomous car without steering wheel, without, um, uh, without accelerator pedals, without any human controls after this talk, if there was parked one outside the front to take you to the train station? A yeah, couple of people. Interesting. So I've asked the same question basically four or five times a year for the past three years. And in the beginning, there was just silence. Right? It was just like, oh my god, not ever would I do this. This is just so scary. Um, now when I ask this, there's a whole bunch of people who are not you know, working with me, which is great, um, who, actually, <laughs> who actually put up their hands. Right? And that is an interesting thing, because we see these stories um, on the news about autonomous driving, about how it's coming, and all of that stuff is true. It might not be coming as fast as most people expect, but all of that stuff is true. It is coming. And we see the uptake in terms of people who are not only excited about this technology, but are willing to try it also rises with that. And that's a really good sign, but also comes with a lot of responsibility because ultimately we will have to develop uh, de deliver this technology in a way 
that is both comfortable and safe. Okay, so what do we do? Well, first of all, we're going to let the cars drive. Duh, right? Um, okay, we're going to let the cars get better at driving over time. All right, so that's, that's not interesting. Okay. Um, we let the cars decide when they can drive. Okay, so now it becomes really, really interesting, right? So, so um, imagine the following scenario. You buy a car, right? This is your brand new car and you've opted for the autonomy pack and that has cost you uh, ideally of the order of what you pay for, I don't know, seat heating, right? So like you know, a couple of hundred bucks and you drive off the forecourt and we propose that at that point, your car will know how to do exactly no things other than you being driven by you, okay? Um, that already sounds pretty odd to most people in terms of an autonomous vehicle, a self-driving car, knows no things, okay. So then you go home and you show off your car to your friends and you drive to your friends and you fall into the daily routines of your life and you start doing the school run and your daily commute and every now and then you go and visit grandma and every now and then you do something totally unexpected which is go on holiday. Um, and all the while the car observes where you go, how you drive there, and not necessarily in a big brotherly way, which sounds a bit scary, but mainly in a sense that it will get used to the environment that you operate in. And that's a really, really important point. Okay. And then one day when you're stuck on the A34, maybe in some traffic jam, likely, you will see on the dashboard a light come on. And that light will indicate that actually for the next 300 meters, that car, your car, can now drive you by itself. Why? Because you've been through that space. A million times, it's seen what the space looks like when it's raining and when it's snowing and when the sun shines and mainly when it's overcast. And it's perfectly fine to do that. It knows where it is. It can deal with those situations. Interesting. Okay. So you can then imagine that, one, this is very, very different from the sort of model that we expect when somebody talks to us about autonomous cars, right? Um, it's very different from this idea of autonomy on demand, where I just get into a car and it's just a thing that has no steering wheel, no controls, and maybe a couch and a toaster, something futuristic, right? And you just say, take me to wherever, and it will just do that. It's a very, very different model. Also, you can see how that might actually be an attractive proposition for car manufacturers, because all of a sudden you get into some form of service proposition, where you're saying, well, actually, car manufacturers can now compete over amount of miles driven autonomously for amount of miles given for training for example, right? Just like they compete over fuel efficiency these days. And that's really interesting. And in a little while, I'm gonna to talk to you about this idea of an experience, this experience paradigm, which underlies and shapes much of the technology that we develop. And once you kind of get into the realm of experiences, how individual vehicles experience their surroundings, you suddenly also see how a service model springs up around that, where you can say, actually, car manufacturers can suddenly become service providers just like your TomTom -tom or your digital map provider where experiences get shared throughout the community of people who drive your cars and all of a sudden, despite me never having driven from London to Edinburgh, suddenly I can because you have, right? And all of a sudden, that becomes interesting because we believe it's a more realistic route to market than what, than what's usually on offer. All right, so what that boils down to is that we offer not to drive everybody everywhere always, Though ultimately that is the goal. But it means that we drive some of the people to some of the places some of the time, which is somewhat counterintuitive. Okay, so that's kind of the philosophy behind it, and I hope it kind of gives some form of idea of what underlies philosophically the way that we approach the t uh, development of the technology that I'm going to talk about now. So I mentioned earlier we need to actually talk about four different things. We need to figure out what our environment looks like, some form of representation of it. Think of it as a map, though later it'll call, I'll call it experience because it comes in lots of different shapes and sizes. We will need to find ourselves in the map. We need to localize. We need to be able to navigate in that map. Why? Because otherwise we won't know where we're going, right, on a kind of um, wider scale. Then I'll talk about perception, which is what is actually around me. And I won't have time to talk about planning, but that'll take us some while anyway. So let's start with the, with the first bit. So think about mapping or low-cost serving. What does the world look like? Okay, so here's a bit of substrate. This is a thing that underlies a lot of our tech. So what you see uh, on the right there, this gold brick, is an off-the-shelf component. It's basically two cameras. It's called a stereo camera pair. Um, and what you see on the left at the top 
are the two frames, the two views that each individual camera has. So each camera sees one of those pictures. They're slightly offset, they're slightly angled, and in that view, you basically find some interesting points, right, across those two camera images, uh, and that's a standard computer vision sort of thing. And you try to match these interesting points up, and because you've got two of those, and you know something about how far those cameras are apart, you can say something about where these points are in space. And then you match them also through time, as you drag this camera along, and what you get out at the other end is an idea of ego motion. You figure out how the camera moves through the world. Okay? So it's called visual dometry. It's a fairly standard sort of thing. So just given the camera, we can understand our motion. And that underlies a lot of the tech that I'm going to talk to you about in terms of the navigation. Okay. Let's say I have that camera, and let's say I put it into a taxi cab top thing uh, right there. Um, and let's say I take a laser, which is you know, not unlike this laser that I'm holding here, just that it spins very, very fast, uh, and it scans in a plane like this, uh, and it provides me uh, you know, of the order of 500 laser returns, so range measurements, like when I point this thing at a wall, uh, as well as how reflective a material is. Okay? Let's say I take that, and I also bolt that to the same car. And then I perform a little bit of magic, um, which basically tells me exactly where that camera is with respect to the laser, and vice versa, clearly. And not just in terms of space, but also in terms of time. Right? Each one of these will provide data at sort of a different rate, and it turns out that timing between those two is very, very important. But okay, so now for all intents and purposes, these things are one device. So if I know where the laser is with respect to the camera, I control the camera through space, and because the laser moves with it, I can say something about how the laser's moved. And because of that, I can then take those laser points, those range measurements, that I kind of trawl through space, and I can assemble them in sort of a 3D model of the world. Okay? And that's basically, that's basically the same thing again. So we drive along in this sort of Doctor Who effect. We track the, the laser light through space, the curtain of laser light through space, and we can, because we know how the laser moves, we can assemble that at the other end. Okay, what does that look like? Well, um, about four years ago, four or five years ago, it looked like this. Okay, so this is driving through London. It's a full 3D model. It's a point cloud model. Okay. Um, why is this interesting? Because for the time, it's pretty damn good because we don't stop. We literally just hook this stuff up to a car and we manually drive that car through London. Okay. And we get a sort of centimeter accurate 3D survey of the, what the world looks like at traffic time. Okay. So that's, that's really interesting. So we can now very cheaply and very accurately map the world. If you ask me what this looks like now, we call this thing a, a scene prior. If I go back to the Lutz project in Milton Keynes, well, this is the kind of stuff that, this is the kind of data that we get right now. So, again, we have a system that drives through Milton Keynes very, very regularly. Uh, and when it comes back, it produces something like this. In fact, as it's out there, it produces something like this. So, now this is a colored point cloud. Uh, the color comes from the fact that we have cameras on the vehicle, and we can, because we know where the... Um, where the laser is with respect to the cameras, we can simply project the laser points into the camera image and just color that return with whatever color is in the image, right? So it's pretty straightforward. So, so far, this is, this is pretty straightforward. There's not really much to it, other than the fact that the detail, the devil is really in the detail here, okay? So coming up with that sort of map is, is not straightforward. But of course, we can go one step further, and we can say, well, so far, we've only looked at point clouds, okay, which are points in space, and if I want to know something about a region that doesn't happen to have a point in it, which, you know, mathematically is enormous, that region, um, then I, I don't know anything about that region. So what about I come up with a continuous representation of the world, which isn't based on points, but actually on surfaces. So wherever I click, I can still measure distances between stuff, for example. For example, okay? And that's called a dense reconstruction. And so based on similar sort of methods, but in this case vision only, we can come up with sort of city scale reproductions, 3D models of what the world looks like. And for all intents and purposes for us, these are the sort of maps that we talk about. Okay, so that's the representation of the world that we deal with. How do I actually figure out where I am in such a representation? What, how, how, how do I look up? How is that useful to me? Well, um, so We've talked previously about the fact that we've got this laser and it kind of trawls this curtain of laser light through the environment. And of course, I've done this during my mapping run um, and I can do this during my live run as well. And I can take a small section 
of that, something like this. Um, and I can match that small section that I've just seen to my global map or my kind of wider experience in that sense, right? And that works pretty well because certainly, particularly locally, this stuff is metrically very consistent. So I can point at this and I can look at that the, that, you know, that the triangle and the, um, the sort of road markings there look pretty consistent. They look like the real thing, right, which is great. So I can take that, I can match it. Now, why is that actually interesting approach? Why isn't that something that everybody does, right? Um, because at the time we did this, which was back in 2012, um, we did an unusual thing in that we pointed the laser downward. We actually wanted it to see the floor. Usually what people do is they take the laser, they point it forward, uh, and what happens is when you accelerate, you kind of do this, and when you um, decelerate, you kind of do this, and particularly when you do this, you suddenly see the ground, which means that your vehicle thinks there's something in front of you, which made for a very, very uncomfortable ride, which made for very sick passengers, okay? So that's why that was interesting. Okay, so that was very, very, it's a, a counterintuitive intuitive sort of, um, innovative way of doing it. So we embrace this, this idea of ground strike. But more importantly, this thing doesn't use any GPS. Okay, it is infrastructure free. And that's very important, and we'll see in a, uh, in, a, in a few minutes why. But it's very, very important because we don't really rely on these kind of lumps of metal flying around in space. Um, there's also no inertial navigation system, right? So if you think about, for example, how at that time Google did it, um, they had this big spinny thing on the top, which is a, a laser scanner, but it's a 3D laser scanner, so they didn't have to kind of accumulate those point clouds to do matching like that. Um, that was of the order of 80K. Um, and in order to figure out how that laser has moved through the world, they used an INS system, an inertial navigation system, which was of the order of about 100K. So the option for your autonomy system suddenly came at the price of about 200,000 hmm. pounds. Okay, that's certainly a lot more than my car costs. Um, I wouldn't want an option at that price, okay? So it's nice because it's cheap, it's very effective. That system at the time cost you of the order of 4,000 pounds, okay? And that's why it was very exciting. Okay, so how do we do the matching? Um, well, we actually uh, do, do an interesting thing here because we've got this 3D information. Imagine you take that 3D information, you take it and you squash it down onto a grid, right? Which essentially is like building a 2D histogram, okay? Uh, and then that's kind of this guy over here, that's your kind of world map. And then you take your local swathe of road that you see, you also squash that down, and you match it, but in that 2D histogram space, which means that you kind of capture bits of the 3D environment. You do some compression, but you capture bits of the 3D environment, but you match it in 2D, which makes this incredibly fast, okay? So that was another bit of that, another piece for that puzzle. And finally, the question is, well, actually, how useful is this? I mean, okay, I'm, I'm telling you this localizes, but how well does it localize? Well. Turns out it's pretty damn hard to get what we call ground truth in the world, right? So measuring a localization system and comparing it against like, you know, what really is going on would require some uber localization system that ideally tells you exactly where that is and what's going on, right? That's a pretty hard problem to solve. So the way that we actually um, do this is we, we, we look at relative performance. So we spend a lot of money on an inertial navigation system. We also bolt that to the car. So it's talking about of the order of 100,000 pounds, right? We also bolt that to the car. And then we drive the same regions, the same lap, for example, lots and lots and lots and lots. And we see how consistent the measurements are that we actually get back, given that we always drive in a fairly na narrow lane, right? Okay. So what you see here, then, is the result of basically that. So we you know, drove kind of 51 kilometer tr uh, laps um, around a test site up in Bedbrook uh, back at the time. And what we see here in gray are sort of the, the, the traces that the INS gives you, the inertial naviga navigation system, the 100,000 pound thing. And what you see in red is the localization that you get from our system at the time. And the fact that you, oops, the fact that you look at this and you see something that is very, very narrow in red is actually really, really encouraging because ideally in that point, at that place, the vehicle was always in the same place and it's the navigation system the inertial navigation system in this case, that tells you you're jumping around a lot, right? Interestingly, um, if you look at the entire loop, it's, you know, it's, red is definitely more consistent, which makes us happy, but something crazy clearly happens here, right? Because it just goes all over the place. Any ideas? Hmm? It's not an obstruction on the road, but there is an obstruction. What that is, it's, it's a leafy area, so there are trees there, right? 
and the inertial navigation system is very, very expensive, mainly because it has a bunch of sensors, including a GPS, right? So what you see here is a whole bunch of GPS drift that you get from things like multipath, just because there's some trees there, right? And that highlights another problem. GPS might be cheap, but it's really noisy. So if you go into a shop and you buy your kind of Garmin 50 quid GPS, you have an average error of about f um, 10 meters, okay? Now, if you're in a car that is run by GPS, of that order, and uh, you go around a roundabout uh, with another car that has also got a GPS and which kind of controls it, bad things happen, okay? So we don't want to be in that place. The other thing, of course, is I can spend another 100 bucks and neither of you will have GPS, okay? So I can, I can very easily jam it. And so based on that, what we really, really want is this infrastructure-free, on onboard sort of sensing approach only, okay? That's what we're chasing here. Okay, upside of that, though, is what we've got here is really pretty accurate because we don't rely on this sort of um, easily uh, jammable signal. Okay, that's great. Um, that's based on laser. Well, can we make this cheaper? And the answer is yes, we can. So if we didn't need a laser, if we could just do the whole thing by vision, that would be pretty damn awesome, right? Because now we're actually not touching the world anymore, so we don't need to spend light, um, money on sending out photons, but we can just capture light as it comes in, right? Um, that's good, so laser costs you of the order of 3,000, 4,000 um, pounds. Camera will cost you, hopefully, a few hundred bucks, if that. Okay, so how might that work? Okay, so in the beginning, we've seen this, this, this trick where we kind of do this stereo matching, right? We've had these two frames and we had the kind of interesting points matching across, yeah, in order to provide the visual odometry. We can pull exactly the same trick, it's just that we don't match across, but we match through time, all right? So on one hand, where it says memory, we can say, this is the, this is the, the sort of um, memory uh, that the car recorded last time it went out. And on the live side, we see what the car sees right now. And if we can match the two across, we get some form of idea as to where we are in this sort of memory. Now, note that I could also call this memory a map. It's not a 3D map like we've just seen it, but it's also a sort of map, right? And because of this generality, I will also refer to it as an experience, and that will become clear in just, in just a second, okay? Because this idea isn't new at all, right? So a lot of people who work in vision have tried this, and usually where it goes wrong is right here, okay? So the problem is that the world changes. Life would be a lot easier if the world didn't keep changing. Traditionally, what you would do is you would say, okay, well, let's go out and let's get some data, and you would build a model Right? And usually that would be some form of non-parametric or parametric model or whatever. Uh, and you would get all this data and you would kind of cram it in and you maybe, you might even come up with something generative where you say, I would like to build a model that tells me that if I stick in the fact that it's raining, that tells me what my images should look like so I can then do the matching. So I can perturb my, my images because it's now raining so I can match them more easily. Problem with that is that building that model is an approximation. And because we're now talking about something that's fairly complicated, performing inference in that model is going to be an approximation. And never mind the approximation, you now have to say, okay, well, what kind of factors do I want to account for, right? So I can account for the fact that it's raining, very likely, that it's overcast, very likely, occasionally that it's sunny, um, good. Uh, what about leaves? We've talked about those before, right? So they're interesting because they can, you know, trees can block GPS, okay, but Leaves, particularly when it's sunny, are a real pain in the butt, right? Because you get shadows, and as the sun moves, those shadows change, right? So that really, really, really affects appearance. And it's not just leaves, it's buildings, right? All, a, anything like that. So very swiftly, you have a huge long list that, of things that you may or may not have to account for, all of which are approximations, and that usually is where this breaks, okay? So um, somebody called Winston Churchill, I kid you not, um, had a really, really, really good idea. He came back and he said, you know, we should just go out and we should just record everything. Let's just record everything. Okay, all right, so um, we go out and record everything. How does that help us? Well, if the world really was continuously forever changing, then that wouldn't help us at all because we'd always be recording stuff. But what if it doesn't change forever? What if there's only a fixed number of times that such a, that, that environment around us changes, right? Um, well, let's see, okay. So the idea was that experience the changing places of the world, all of them, and we go out, uh, so Winston, what Winston did is he took out the car uh, about three times a week, three times a day for three months. 
uh, and got a whole lot of experience data like that. Um, and what you see here is basically the same place at different times of day in different weather conditions, right? So the idea is that I would like, when I see this, I would like to know that I'm actually in this place, okay? And here we see the effect of shadows. When I see this, I would like to know that actually I'm in this place, right? And so on. Uh, pretty challenging problem. And the idea there would be then to say, okay, well, actually, if I want to turn this into something useful, I could then say, well, I've got my visual odometry running, that's the stereo thing from the beginning, right? That kind of tells me something about relative motion. And I take my live feed here, and I move through this world, which is mostly sort of red, yellowish, okay? That's my world right now. And as I move through this, so I kind of move through this deck of cards, I have a past experience, a memory, that kind of is mostly yellow, and a memory that is mostly red, so that's good, that's good, because we see red and yellow right now. And that means I can somehow localize myself in both the red and the yellow one. And let's imagine that that's a parameter for our system, right? I'm going to say I only want to be able to um, operate autonomously if I can localize within two experiences. That's my condition on this system. And then something crazy happens. All of a sudden, you know, my, my world suddenly turns a little bit green. Okay? And all the yellow is gone. And please don't talk to me about mixing colors now because that really confuses me. Um, but I suddenly see something green. Uh, my yellow is gone, so I can no longer localize my yellow experience. My red experience is fine because there's still some red in my world, hooray. Uh, but of course, my condition is now violated, right? So I can only uh, localize myself against one experience. And the system will say, you know what? I don't have any confidence in that, uh, that I know what I'm doing. Uh, I, I'm not going to drive. All right, so you have to do a thing. At the same time, though, it knows that it doesn't know how to deal with this, and it goes, you know what, I'm just going to take what I see right now in terms of the visual odometry, and I'm going to add that as a new experience. I'm going to call this green. All right? And next time that happens, you will find that you now also have this green experience, and you become this little bit more robust. Note that nobody's actually told the system that it needs to record now. This is something that it figured out by itself just because it couldn't perform the task that it was meant to perform, and that's a really, really interesting property. All right, so Winston took out the car um, lots, and about three months later, he came back and he said, you know what, the answer is 33. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, and it turns out that actually, if you look at this, so this is basically a heat map of the test site, and he drove the car for as long as it took him to not ever get lost using this system. Okay, so he never ever got lost driving around this after that. And what this heat map shows you is how many experiences were required in those particular areas in order for this to happen. And it turns out that on these really, really long, boring stretches, it was of the order of, you know, three to five experiences. Why? Because actually it's just flat ground with a bit of street and some grass next to it. Nothing really happens. Um, it got a bit nuts around here. Why? Hmm? Trees. Exactly right. Trees. So you can see this kind of high idea. It's exactly that reason. So it's exactly where we would expect this, this really to have an impact, where you get the shadows and the sun moves across. But it turns out, even in that environment, after about 33 experiences, you manage to localize all the time. And that was a pretty, pretty successful idea. So um, following on, uh, we sent a student out on his bike for 600 kilometers. Um, so he biked around Oxford, and he did that so successfully that actually he found a way um, of not only not getting lost using the system, but also a way of efficiently managing that amount of data that you need to actually deal with in order to have this experience system running, right? Um, and so that's what we see at the bottom here. So at the top is kind of the experience, the live memory matching that we saw before, and at the bottom it's the kind of experience, the, the kind of top five experiences that you can match against if uh, you see the current view. And that was a pretty clever thing. Now, and I can say that because I had nothing to do with it. Um, now, it turns out that that system really, really is quite robust because uh, we then, um, said he can stop doing the biking, and we gave him a car, uh, and he's now done, I think, over a thousand kilometers on this, um, and it's still working well, but note, it's not only working on cars, it's also working in warehouses, and it's also working in sort of Mars-like environments. Um, some of the technology that I've talked to you already, the VO system, the visual odometry system, was just licensed to go to Mars. Um, that was a pretty successful thing, so this is part of the field trials for that. And it also works in sort of off-roading environments. So it's pretty robust. It's not the only thing that you want to use, because sometimes you might want to use a laser for localization, but it's a pretty robust system. Okay, so that's kind of as far as, as we want to talk about localization. What about perception? So 
I could probably spend about an hour talking about each one of the technologies that I kind of put on these slides. Uh, I don't really want to do that. I'd like to get to a different place. But let me just give you a flavor of the type of perception systems that we have. So um, one question that we, that we need to ask, for, of course, is, well, actually, even in the absence of any localization, so I have no idea where I'm in the world, I still need to know what's drivable and what isn't, right? So that's the thing that you can figure out by basically doing some, some uh, very clever math in terms of machine vision. I can again say that because I have nothing to do with it. Um, and this gives us some form of road segmentation, right? And that's a, that's a pretty important thing. Um, okay. Given that we've got these beautiful 3D maps of the world, uh, what if we only had those and we only had a 3D perception system that speaks point cloud but not images? Can we do generic object detection in those point clouds? And the answer is yes, we can. We can absolutely do that. Um, and doing that at speed is a pretty trig uh, tricky thing. So um, this is a, a data set from Motorway in Europe, I hasten to add, before anybody um, kind of worries about that. Uh, and here we detect cars a while away. Um, so, you know, few, uh, like a, a 100 meters or so away, 200 meters away. Um, and uh, uh, we can do that at a speed now that is really quite useful for actual operation based on um, kind of standard data like that. In fact, this is the same thing, exactly the same system that we used for cars operating in crowds. So there's a, a small crowd running around in front of a vehicle. Uh, and again, we can do that now at, at 20 hertz, which was kind of, it's a fairly recent thing, and we're quite proud of, of being able to do that. Um, but this is kind of standard stuff. Or I, sh I should say this also, this is um, the same thing, but now we're actually operating in images, right? So can we do pedestrian detection uh, in images? And the answer is yes, we can. Now, if you've seen any talk by anybody who is from Google or you know, any other big sort of company or even NVIDIA or whatever, this sort of um, image, certainly the image data processing is not going to be new to you. Okay? You are going to look at this and you will go, well, I can download a thing that will do something like this. Okay. So where's the nugget here? Oh, I should say traffic lights. Yeah, okay. So we can, we can also interpret traffic lights, which is clearly important. Um, but again, this is meant to be a flavor, not, not so much of a, of a, of a beauty parade. Um, but, but where's the nugget in this? So if I can download this stuff, how does that, you know, why do I even talk about it? Because actually there's something to be said about how we apply the experience paradigm in this context, okay? How can we kind of bring this experience thing in? Because implicitly what we've just done in the kind of um, case study of the navigation system is we've moved away from this idea of having uh, a system that works out of the box everywhere, somewhat mediocrely, to one that actually embeds itself into the workspace where it is being used, okay? We go away from mediocrity everywhere towards workspace-specific experts. I want to be absolutely awesome where I operate. Why does that make sense? Because actually, the vehicle that I kind of drive here, you know, I don't really care how well it does at people detection in Tokyo because it's very unlikely that I ever drive it in Tokyo, right? Um, so can we replicate that somehow in the perception realm? And the answer is, well, actually, yes, we can. And while many people out there kind of talk about the, the sort of um, action perception loop, so perceiving the world will tell me how I have to act, and I can act to better perceive the world, that's a known thing, it turns out there's also such a thing as a navigation perception loop, right? So it turns out that uh, if I know where I am, I can improve my perception system, and my perception system clearly, clearly will help me to you know, know where I am. Okay, so how can we implement that? So, right, imagine, and some of you will know exactly how that feels. Imagine I come to you and I ask you to uh, uh, implement a pedestrian detector, vision-based, right? Um, that's a very typical thing. It's kind of not, a, uh, uh, not an unusual task. Um, what do you do? You go away, you do a bit of reading, uh, you convince me that it's a useful approach, and then you find yourself a training set, right? You can download this stuff. Training set meaning lots of positive examples, lots of negative examples. Um, you train some form of object detection framework, okay? Uh, and ideally, you then go through a, through a, a loop where you identify fal uh, false positives, right? Uh, you store them somehow, you feed them back into the training process, you retrain your object detector and you keep going, okay? And you do this on this training set that you've downloaded somewhere. All right. Interesting thing about that is you really need some label training data, okay? Why is that interesting? Because that is usually uh, where you have to spend a lot of time or a lot of money to get those labels. Okay, so somebody has to sit down and draw boxes around things. Very, very boring. Okay. Um, all right, so you do that, and you plop that pedestrian detector on the car, 
and you just see how it operates when somebody manually drives the car around, okay? And the result that you get is this. Now, somebody once talked to me uh, and said, you know, Ingmar, the, the problem with vision is that a lot of the results that you see look pretty tantalizing, meaning they really, really don't work, but you kind of get a sense that they maybe could work one day, who knows? The problem with this is that, I mean, I wouldn't get into a car that sees this, right? I mean, I, I suspect most of you would be the same thing. So, we should hopefully be able to do better than that. Okay, so how might we do this? Well, um, you can think about what went wrong. So, if I go to a place like, you know, Inria, and I download the Inria data set, the training set, and I look at what the positives are, they're people, hooray, this is good, um, and I look at what the negative training <laughs> examples are, the negative training examples look like this. And then we kind of went away and we did a lot of thinking um, and sort of uh, a lot of uh, uh, introspection um, and a lot more thinking and we came to the following realization, which made us very sad. There are hardly any ski slopes or <laughs> sort of um, mountain lakes in Oxford. Hmm. Okay, all right. So maybe that's something to do with the fact that our object detector doesn't perform as well in Oxford as it would, for example, in the Alps. All right, maybe. Um, and it turns out that actually getting good negative data is a really, really important thing when it comes to training good object detectors. All right, so we don't have mountain lakes, but what do we have? Well, we have these really awesome 3D reconstructions of what the world looks like, okay? That's got to be useful somehow. Okay, so how might that be useful? Um, well, we can perform a very, very simple check, for example. So we can do something, and this is a, this is a thing that, that other people do. So um, you could, for example, say, well, I'm detecting people, right? And I am um, going to impose that people have to be walking somewhere on the ground, ideally. They don't fly, fly through, the, through the air, and they're probably bigger than two centimeters. All right? Um, seems like a sensible sort of thing. Based on that, you can do some, uh, some sort of a heuristic check and say, well, actually, if that is true and the ground plane is roughly here, um, then I can throw out false detections just based on that. Okay? So that's a useful thing. Many people do that. Um, but also, you get a sense that knowing where you are really helps you because if you know where you are and you have a good model of what the world looks like in that sense, in sort of this 3D model sense, you suddenly end up with a pretty good idea of what kind of heuristics you can employ. You know where the ground is, you know where the walkway is, that sort of stuff, right? Um, and of course, you can take that much, much further. You could say, well, actually, I can do some much more expensive tests that I can run overnight, and then suddenly we can have a philosophical discussion about robot dreaming, right? Uh, where you say, well, actually, if, some th if things intersect with other things in my scene prior, my detections intersect with things in my scene prior, probably it's not a person, okay? Because it's probably a tree, all right? Okay, so knowing where you are really helps you. So let's just pause here and say, what do people usually do? Well, you, at, uh, this is at deployment time, this is what happens on the car. Uh, you get some image data feed, you get some object detector, you uh, run this sort of scene filter, this thing that I've just talked about, right? Uh, and then you output the detections. Okay, um, fine. But what if you have pose, you know where you are and you've got these models? What if, instead of just throwing the things that you filtered out away and you stick them in some form of memory, what if you, you use that memory to retrain your object detector in some background thread or overnight or something like that? Well, if we look at that bit in the middle, we really see that this is just the same loop that we talked about previously, right? It's the same thing. But the key thing is it doesn't require any label training data, and we call this thing experience-based classification for exactly that reason, right? Um, and that was something that when, uh, when, when Jeff and Karina over there kind of found this, it was a really, really interesting thing to see for us because, actually, because of the following reason. This is what it looks like. So, in essence, what happens is you put your bulk standard object detector, your pedestrian detector, on the car and it does really not that well, okay? And you kind of get a little bit depressed. And you basically drive along and because you've got this scene filter, you kind of filter out things that are clearly not people, okay? Clearly not people, like those ones, for example. All right, and then you stick them into that memory and overnight you kind of retrain. Um, and you go out the next day again. And this is what that looks like. And you go, okay, well, there's still stuff that is wrong, that stuff. Okay, so you stick them in the memory, uh, and not just these, of course, but everything that kind of doesn't pass your test. And the next day you go out again. And all of a sudden you kind of get the sense that not so many bad things are happening. Okay? 
and keep, so one thing to be said here is these are raw detections. So for those who, who kind of worry about this bit, this is not involving tracking because I really want to show the effect on the, on the, on the detections. Um, so that's day three. Um, you do that a couple more days, and all of a sudden, you end up with something that is not only um, tantalizing, but you can get a real sense that this is something that now may almost be usable with a bit of tracking, with a bit of interpolation between those bounding boxes, right? We all of a sudden get to a place where this is a usable thing. But here's the real kicker, and this is something where Jeff and Karina have done really, really well. Um, you don't label any of that data. All you do is you get into your car and you drive. So that was a big moment for us. That was nice. Okay. Um, that's interesting, and so I've just talked about that, you know, awesome perception systems, and that's really good. Let me talk about a diff different thing, a slightly more elaborate experience, okay? So the, the kind of white dots that you see here are these kind of 3D point cloud priors, right? So that's the sort of model of the world. And all the colored things are things that are added to that map. They're semantic annotations. They're things like lane directions, where the lanes are, what direction you can drive them, the kind of big circles there are intersections. Um, the kind of uh, cyan bits are sort of uh, uh, road boundaries, that sort of stuff. Um, and you can think of this video almost as the kind of two streams of consciousness of the vehicle, right? So everything that is, that is kind of a, a, a white point cloud with sort of uh, clearly annotated labels on it is something that can happen offline. And you can think of that as when you commute to work, you know where your, uh, where, which lane you need to be in, right? You know where the lanes are and everything else. Typically, that doesn't tend to change. Um, but what you don't know, of course, is whether there's a car next to you or a cyclist or a cat or, you know, a lady with a pram or anything like that, or a father with a pram. Um, uh, and so that sort of information is captured here in terms of everything that has sort of got, got a box around it. So these, these are kind of sort of live stream things that the car sort of sees and perceives as some sort of object. Okay, now the big question is, I've just talked about all these perception systems, where do these annotations come from, right? Do we have detectors and classifiers that will help us find and interpret lane markings and all this other stuff? And the answer is yes, we absolutely do. Uh, the question then is, okay, well, that's great, so problem solved, we can make those experiences, we can make those maps, we can make those semantic annotations, um, and we can all go home. And sadly, that is not the end of the story, because actually, when it comes to something like this that is safety critical, we tend to not really use those detectors other than in bootstrapping, okay? Why is that? Because actually, we don't really trust the output of those things when it comes to safety critical applications, okay? It still needs to be double-checked by a human in that sense. Why is that? Because actually it's very, very hard to know when a system has gone wrong. And if you ask me, that is one of the most fundamental questions that in perception we still have to answer. It doesn't mean it's not answerable, it doesn't mean we can't do many useful, amazing things on the way to that place, but it's one of the big outstanding questions that certainly I think about and my group thinks about. One thing that we do, actually I should probably start that again, one thing that we do instead is try to say, well actually I don't want a human to label all of this stuff, I'd like a human to somehow efficiently input into the system so we can come up with these annotations um, in some of reasonable amount of time. And we do this via a, a thing called active learning. So we have um, a tool, and here we actually try this with annotating car parks because it was a project um, that was dealing with car parks, the recharge project. And the idea there is actually you go through iterations, right? So a human annotator, a human uh, labeler, a human operator labels one or two things and says, today I'm interested in car parks, today I'm interested in fire extinguishers, whatever. And then you press this learn button uh, and basically, the system goes away and goes, ha, you've shown me a couple of examples. I think you will also be interested in the following things. Blah. Right? And after the first bit, let me just play it again. After the first bit, uh, you get a whole lot of noise, right? So until you show it some negatives. But then, of course, you only work with proposals. So over here, you just go, yes, 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 no, 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 whatever, you know, do a couple of things. And then press learn again. And after a number of iterations, it turns out that actually you can suddenly end up with a very good representation of the world for ideally what is minimum effort by the operator. That's really, really important. And so in terms of bringing this sort of technology to market, having a, an intuitive tool that can be used by people who are not necessarily experts in machine learning or experts in machine vision or experts in robotics is a really, really important thing. And so, of course, once you have a semantic map like that, that's exactly the same idea. You can then drive around your car park and simply project your map back into the world that you see at the top there. So at the top is the live view of the vehicle and you see kind of the parking spaces projected back into it. Okay. Um, why do I say that? This is one of my favorite videos um, because actually it really drives home the point that I just tried to make, okay? 
we are only as good as our understanding of the world when it comes to interpreting the world, right? So this toad knows no things about smartphones and knows many things about, about ants, okay? Um, so why do I, <laughs> why do I, why do I say that? Because we talk about this, this, this difference between end-to-end -end autonomy, right? So you just go in, it's on demand, it drives you anywhere, everywhere, all the time. And this idea of having somebody in charge who still kind of has a supervisory function in it, so we can test the corner cases of this thing. So think about it this way. If you had a system like our robot car, and it was on a motorway, right? And the roads are completely clear. There's nothing in front of you. And your laser says, go, and your radar says, go, and everything else says, go, uh, because those are the things that, that it looks for. But at the side of the road, is a burning fuel tanker. Would you drive past that? Probably not. But of course, I've never told my system to look for a burning fuel tanker. It has zero idea what a burning fuel tanker is, right? So there are things, there are cases out there which are you know, not maybe as abstract as this one, but there are cases out there that we need to explore, first of all, be, until we have some confidence that we, can do this, um, that we can do this robustly and safely. Now, it doesn't mean to say it's impossible, not at all but it means we need to choose carefully the problems that we work on in the beginning. And that is why prob um, projects like the Lutz project, this kind of pod project, the pods in Milton Keynes, the pods in, in, in Greenwich, are so unbelievably valuable because they allow us to feel this technology on a reasonably kind of large scale compared with one vehicle, on a reasonably large scale, in interaction with the environment in a safe but continuous way. We would like to experience all the corner cases that the environment can possibly throw at us in such a way that if anything goes wrong, we are totally in control of, of what the vehicle does. We can bring it to a safe stop, um, and no bad things will happen. And that's really why these projects are important. OK, all right. Um, bunch, of, bunch of conclusions which are clearly obvious. Um, autonomy is the future, absolutely. Robotics is clearly a, a part of that. Uh, many challenges still lie ahead. But here's the kicker. So this, this very much, and in the past, you know, um, 50 minutes, I've talked about autonomous driving, you know, that's what I came here to do. Um, but I'm not really an autonomous driving kind of guy. I'm a robotics kind of guy, okay? And I deal with the three core questions. Where am I, what's around me, and how do I act? Now, why is that exciting? Why do I even say that? Because between here and fully blown autonomy, there's a whole vista of things where this sort of stuff is useful, okay? Where might that be? Well, logistics, city planning, those maps, those surveys that we produce as a byproduct, is very important to people who want to, for example, plan heavy goods vehicles, transports, right? Routes for those people. Um, okay, uh, looking for potholes, sort of road infrastructure management. Imagine every single car had a little thing on it, like a little box um, that basically assesses the road underneath it. Not much, comes for free because the council pays for it, right? And that sends that data back and all of a sudden you not only find the potholes but you also see how they evolve and you can do things like uh, maintenance scheduling, right? That's quite important. Um, things like asset detection. So we can clearly detect cars because that's a useful thing for driving. Um, but what if you wanted to know where all those cars are? What if you wanted to know where they typically park? Again, so you can figure out whether a wide load transport will fit through this road on a Tuesday afternoon. Right? Um, what if it's not actually road infrastructure? What if it's rail infrastructure? And all of this stuff is real. So some of our tech that I've just talked about actually um, is mounted on trains and goes up and down some train lines. Uh, with the express purpose to say, well, actually, um, I probably shouldn't say that, but we don't really know where stuff is on the railways, okay? And that might not come as a surprise to you. Um, but we don't really know where any of that stuff is. So if we could localize a train along its track and detect some of the things that are kind of important to the rail, work, uh, rail sort of infrastructure, um, we can suddenly start a whole system where we actually say, you know, today I'm interested in fire extinguishers, tomorrow I'm interested in junction boxes. Um, okay, here are the junction boxes. This is this particular junction box. It is here. And every time I've passed through, because every train has one of those things, every time I've passed through over the past three months, it looked like this. Oh, and this looks like a bit of rust, and this is how the rust is developing. Actually, if it keeps developing like this, I need to replace it in two months. Okay? So, building information, exactly the same idea. Building information management, exactly the same tech. Um, Warehouses, logistics, uh, automated goods transport, really, really big markets, okay? Why is that exciting? Uh, because for us, it's very easily reachable. Why? Because we don't use GPS. Our tech works in so indoors, it works outdoors, we don't care, right? Um, so uh, having robots go around, navigate, 
transport goods in warehouses is a pretty big deal, commercially, certainly. Um, autonomous science discovery, I love this one. So it turns out that if a Martian danced past the Mars rover right now, nobody would ever know. Okay, why? Because there's only a limited upload bandwidth, so we get a bunch of images out every now and then, um, but we don't know when. Uh, and the rover will do what we tell it to, so it will go to a rock and maybe, hopefully, examine that rock. But everything between that and, you know, looking around, not really much there. So there's a whole field in sort of space science that looks at what is interesting science to be done on Mars and how can we figure that out from a bunch of images? What should we, what should we go and look at? Which rock shall we sample? Um, and so that's kind of an interesting question for us to answer. Um, and of course, energy management on Mars, where we'll be without energy management. You can think about uh, uh, lengthening the life of a planetary rover in its exploration phase simply by saying we can switch the sensors on and off, right, for localization. So that might be a helpful thing to do, okay? Um, and why, why stop at energy management on Mars? We could just go and do energy management in sort of plug-in EV, like electric vehicles on Earth, right? So if you're like me, um, every time your sort of uh, um, petrol light comes on, you break out in a cold sweat. It turns out uh, electric vehicle drivers are in this state mostly, okay? Um, and uh, it, it has a name, it's called range anxiety. I was absolutely perplexed to see this. Um, but the problem with that is that the, the, um, the, the information that your vehicle gives back to you is complete bogus, right? So you get a, mostly, you get a, um, you get a single number, right, that tells you how far your vehicle can go with your expected, uh, with your measured estimated state of charge. Um, of course, that is bogus. If you're in the Alps, you go up the hill, you go down the hill, that you would expect that to change, so it's not a radius. So what do we do? We provide a map, great. Um, many other people have done that. Um, but beyond that, you can imagine that you can use the information, the same information that kind of gets used to your environment. Those systems also get used to how you drive. And they will learn something about, and this sounds a bit odd, but they will get used to your, road, uh, your route preferences, okay? So it may learn that I'm a guy who likes to you know, take the country scenic route, whereas my mom really likes the motorway, okay? Um, and that helps because that really influences your, uh, your, energy uh, your energy usage in your vehicle. What that means, though, is that when you drive off the forecourt with this system, the map for all of us will look exactly the same. But as we drive, it will start to adjust. It will start to adjust how I drive to me, so I'll see my map, my wife sees her map, uh, you know, I would say my kids see their maps, but that's a bit young for that. Mm -hmm. But you get the sense, right? And it's exactly the same sort of idea. It's, it's technology that wraps itself around a user. And that really lies at the heart of what excites me in some of the technology that we develop uh, in, the, in the group. So our aspiration is robust lifelong autonomy. Our vision is to actually achieve that via machines that get better through use forever by learning from demonstration in the wider sense of the word, if you're sort of a, a learning from demonstration sort of guy. Um, and ideally in a manner that's entirely transparent to the user. I would like you to not have to interact with your tool, with your car, with your whatever it is, in any way that you wouldn't otherwise. I'd like you to drive, not click on stuff, okay? And that's really where we come from. And of course, I have the pleasure of standing here and telling you all this stuff. Uh, it turns out we have a pretty big team. Um, none of that would exist without you know, all of these people up there. Um, and some of the people in this room, for that matter. Uh, so I can only take none of that credit, really. Um, and with that, I would like to thank you. And that's it. OK, we do have time for questions. Um, as we are live webcasting and filming this, can you wait for the microphone? And obviously, normal thing applies if you don't want to be on camera or have your voice on camera, get somebody to ask a question for you. Uh, Claire, if we start right down here at the front. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so you talked a lot about like, these naturally occurring light phenomena, wind mm -hmm. phenomena that mm -hmm. might be tricky for a car. But what about intentional sabotage? Mm -hmm. with how vulnerable would these systems would be to that? Mm -hmm. So for instance, if someone like, created artificial uh, light phenomena that were like, supposed to, to trick, mm -hmm. trick the cars? Mm -hmm. um, basically, ultimately, as, as vulnerable as a, as a human-driven car would be. Uh, so if you shine light in the eyes of a driver, you get this issue. You see this in planes, right? So you get the kind of laser strike issue right now. Um, so if you willfully, if you set out to really, really perplex 
a system like that, just like if you set out to really, really perplex a driver, you will manage it. Right, but I guess my question, uh, I guess my question was like, do you think that it could be easier to treat these systems, at least initially, mm -hmm. because like humans might understand that well, this has to be an optical illusion or mm -hmm. something, because like, well, on the side of the road mm -hmm. there is like something that. that mm -hmm. So, uh, in, the, in the spirit of the example of the sort of oil tanker yeah. right by the road, so I think initially, absolutely, it will be easier, but there will be a point when I can't really reason about it, I need to try it, right? Which again, is why the, the, the sort of Lutz project idea, and that the kind of port systems are so unbelievably valuable. So, those pods, uh, you know, they will be autonomous, but they won't be driverless as such, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, there will still be a safety driver in it. And we just need to field these systems as much as we possibly can in sort of as safe an environment as we possibly can create uh, in order to learn about exactly those things. Um, so this one there and then one in the middle at the back. You were saying that the cars be learning a lot from the drivers. Mm -hmm. Is there a way of the car to actually pick up bad habits from the drivers? Is there, is there any sort of way of preventing that? Um, is there a way of pre preventing that? So uh, it depends on the kind of bad habit. So I think there's absolutely scope for that to happen. Um, if you're talking about things like speeding, right? Um, there, are, there are obvious things that can be done to kind of counteract that. Um, if you talk about any sort of other thing that you can pro probably invent, you have to think about it. But if you do something like this, if you learn from demonstration, you need to somehow differentiate what is a good demonstration and what is a bad demonstration. And so that, that, isn't, that isn't absolutely an issue. Luckily, when it comes to driving, um, either, you, I wouldn't say you always get good demonstrations by any means, but I think there's some heuristics that you can apply, like for example, speed limits, that sort of stuff, um, that will help you to some degree differentiate those, those behaviors. But that's a, it's a really good point, yes, absolutely. So you will have that problem, but I think you will be able to deal with it. Having detected uh, your pedestrians, cyclists, and so on, uh, have you done any work in trying to predict what they might do, mm -hmm. the drivers of other vehicles, for example, mm -hmm. okay. um, and uh, therefore emulating a human in that way? Mm -hmm. So uh, in my group, we have not yet, I hasten to add, uh, but that work absolutely is out there. So there is a whole body of work with a whole bunch of people, um, also in involving industry players like Daimler, um, that spend a lot of effort on exactly that. In one of your movie clips, mm -hmm. you show a stationary vehicle detecting humans around it. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a child moving through those humans that it didn't connect with. Mm -hmm. How do you weight a learning experience like that, where you're basically wanting to say, this is a disaster, mm -hmm. rather than just missing say a pedestrian who's standing still. Mm -hmm. Do you use techniques like reinforcement learning? So we do use reinforcement learning. We also use inverse reinforcement learning for learning from demonstration, uh, but not in this particular context. So um, the default position is if we miss anyone, that's a bad thing. The proof um, of the system is very much if the driver has to intervene to prevent something bad from happening. That really is a, is a mistake that we can't possibly tolerate, right? Which is why it's important that we have people in the car that are ready to take control right now, because I can't stand here and say, we will never miss a child. No, I can't do that yet. I believe a day, a day will come when I can say statistically, given all the many, you know, quadrazillion and, you know, enter a big number of miles um, that we've done, we have, you know, um, not, missed a child with our perception system, whereas if you've been a human driver, you would have missed at least three. I think that day will come, but we're not, not anywhere near that yet. But again, the important thing is you can't actually do that without putting those systems out in the field. And again, doing this in sort of, uh, in, a, in a controlled sort of low energy environment where you can experience, in, in sort of the, the, the wider sense of the word, as much of the world as you possibly can is absolutely crucial. Absolutely crucial, and that's why those projects are really, really important for us. A practical question. Um, can you give a roughly estimate when you think I could buy a car with like a postdoc income um, <laughs> <Good luck. laughs> that could actually drive uh, without me driving? Uh, okay, counter question. 
drive in what situation? Just like to work. All the way? Yeah. Okay. Um, that'll be a long time. From like directly from you get in, and it doesn't matter what time it is and what what all the way, and you know, that, yeah, that will take a while. That will take a while. Roughly estimate years. <laughs> um, many. <laughs> <laughs> but that said, um, there will be intermediate times where you can say, well, actually, it, you know, I, I can drive you along certain routes and at certain times, for example. But I think it's really, really interesting and really important to make that differentiation where you say, actually, it's about letting the vehicle decide when it knows enough to offer you that option. Down to you whether you take it, of course, but to offer you that option. Okay. We'll come down front and then to this gentleman. Uh, this, <coughs> we talked a little bit about bicycles and other unpredictables, but basically your model seems to involve building, learning rather like a, 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 a self-dictating machine. Um, um, learning from your own learning. Now you go out into the town and there are all the other people who have got their own driving patterns. Mm -hmm. How does your car deal, deal with them? And then furthermore, how does it deal, what does it have to do differently, or can you do differently, when all the other cars are autonomous vehicles, self-drive mm -hmm. also? Mm -hmm. What happens at that threshold? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, that's a question that comes up a lot. And the interesting thing about that is I think that is probably one of the ones technically you can deal with more easily than others. So uh, being able to build a model, so firstly, if I can build a model of how I drive, I can, I can at the very least start by extrapolating that to other people. I mean, that's kind of what I do and that's a bad thing, but hey. Um, and then I can say, well, once I've got this model, I can measure whether they behave according to what I think they should do. And if they then do not behave according to that model, at the very least, I can say, I can't drive, I can't, I can't do this autonomously, right? At the very least. But of course, in reality, you can do other things. So you don't need to absolutely perfectly be able to predict how somebody moves around um, in order to kind of go along your business. That's, that's one thing. The other interesting thing is that on-road driving is actually a pretty structured affair. You've got lanes, you've kind of got driving directions, you've got speed limits, which you know, are more or less adhered to by most people. Um, uh, you've got the rules of the road, right? And all of these things you can leverage to come up with a strategy that will help you in this sort of context. Now, again, harping back to this, this idea of these sort of pod projects, um, life on a, in a pedestrianized zone is actually a lot more complicated than that because you don't have lanes and you don't have predefined behavior and you will get actively adversarial behavior if any of our other robotics experiments are anything to go by where, you know, the, the sort of paper bag over the camera sort of example, right? <laughs> And I kid you not, this sort of stuff happens, not with the pods, but we've seen it kind of through the years when we kind of bring, bring robots to people, um, which in a way is good because they, they allow us to explore how to deal with these situations. But of course, they also, it also means that we have to design the experiments, the setups, in such a way that we can deal with those things. But in terms of learning models of behavior, figuring out when, when um, other traffic participants that don't <coughs> adhere to that behavior and adapting in some, some sort of meaningful way is a thing that, that is absolutely doable. Okay. Um, here, and then we'll go into that. So you touched on uh, one word, at least on a slide, covering the legal issues. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd be very interested to hear you expand on that, uh, both in terms of regulation, but also liability, uh, and how you think that's going to play out. If the car has an accident, who is liable? Mm -hmm. Could I have the car drive me home from the pub? Mm -hmm. Um, that is also a unsurprisingly common question, particularly the bit of the pub, about the pub, um, <laughs> um, which doesn't make it a, a bad question, it's a good question. Um, so how is that going to play out? I think there are right now two interesting things that need to be considered. One is, what is the regulatory framework that allows us to test that sort of technology? And that is something that is now coming into play. As of late last year, that is certainly something that we have. In terms of who is liable, well, right now, it will always be the person who is actually in control of the car. So you have to have somebody in control of the car, certainly in the UK. I'm not going to talk about the US. Anyway, um, so that's, that's really, really important. Um, there are some things that are actually easier to regulate than others. So for example, there's a, there's a rule that says if you crash into the back of someone, 
just during normal driving operation. Chances are that is your fault. And by, you know, certainly in Germany, with people go, this is your fault because you didn't leave enough space for a safe emergency stop, right? So the upshot of that is that you get ADAS, um, advanced driver assistance systems, that prime your brakes, and in some cases actually um, hit the brakes, right? Because if the guy behind you crashes into you, it's clearly their fault, right? Um, what is much harder to find is something that actually swerves you out of a lane. Why? Because as soon as you swerve out of a lane, the situation isn't that clear cut, right? Who's then liable? Not clear. So uh, right now, sort of in terms of industry and stuff that you can buy on the market, that kind of shies away from, from that sort of aspect. Um, that said, the regulation is really, about, is really about how we test autonomous systems, and that is clearly coming. And to answer the second part of that is where is it going, I think a lot will hinge on getting miles under our belt. And Google have done a fantastic job in that respect because they didn't go and ask for permission, they went, and one day they came back and they went, Ooh, you know, we've done 100,000 miles, Woo which is great, they've done an amazing job at doing this. But what's their argument? Their argument is, we've been driving a lot and nothing happened, right? Um, and that, I think, is a position we need to get ourselves into. We need to be able to say we've driven, you know, a Google miles of, of, of driving autonomously in all these different situations, and statistically speaking, we made a lot fewer mistakes, some with, you know, catastrophic, potentially catastrophic uh, results, a lot fewer mistakes than a human would ever have done. There's a danger here as well, because, um, sorry if I just may, but th th there's a danger here as well, which is this. I think, you know, I mean, have you seen the, the thing on the news about the, the, the Google car hitting the bus? Yeah, right, right. Um, so that's an interesting case, because on one hand, I could now stand here and say, well, you know what? How fast was that car traveling? Two miles per hour, right? There was a guy who was in charge of it, and it turns out, as far as I know from those reports that you've also read, who also saw the bus and thought it was going to slow down. So for, you know, for argument's sake, you could argue if that person had actually been driving and wanted to change lanes, he would still have made that mistake. Right? So I can't at this point point at this guy and at this particular incident and say, oh, if a human had been driving then, this would never have happened because actually it sounds like it probably might have, right? But to say that, you know, autonomous systems will never make any mistakes and therefore never have any accidents would be a pretty ridiculous thing to say, right? So I think we can agree that this will happen at some point. But there's going to be a point where we look at such an accident and we go, okay, well, actually, if a human had been driving, this would never happen ever, right? Um, and the danger then is to say, well, actually, that means that the whole thing doesn't work, right? And to lose the big picture and say, actually, machines driving um, just, just doesn't work. Whereas on, on balance, you have to look at the overall picture and say, actually, statistically speaking, even though that, that particular accident looks like a real stupid thing, um, overall, it's still, it, it may well at that point be safer, which is what I would hope. We're going to come down this end of the room for a couple of questions. If the system has to relinquish control and put the user back in the loop, how do you ensure that it does that gracefully? Because if the user is, as your example says, Skyping or programming, mm -hmm. it's going to take them a good few seconds at the very least to mm -hmm. Absolutely. appreciate the situation yep. and respond appropriately. Yes. How do you get around that? Yes. So um, that is a really, really, really good point. And as far as I'm concerned, that is probably the thing in this story that I, that I personally worry about most. Um, that said, there are absolutely models that will get around that. So for example, um, I'm just gonna mention this tangentially, there is actually a whole bunch of people who do nothing but user interfaces uh, with these sort of properties who are pretty confident that they can solve that particular problem. I know no things about this sort of, <laughs> so I can't really speak for them. But there's also uh, an operation where you can actually say, well actually, if you can come up with some form of thing that, or some form of um, mechanism where you have in the kind of perpetuation of those experience, some form of early indication that something's going wrong, because you do believe that these vehicles will communicate with one another, if not for autonomy, then about road conditions and that sort of stuff, then that actually becomes plausible again, right? Uh, but I think, I think you're right, so I think you put your finger there on a the thing that I can't say right now there's a clear solution to this and this is what it looks like. Do I think it's unsolvable? No, I don't. Um. Hi. Uh, I have a question. You, you have uh, thought of you know, all this for electric vehicles, mm -hmm. uh, mostly, and it may come a day where you have to pick up the electricity from the road, some mm -hmm. sort of you know, uh, conductive or inductive yep. charging lane. Mm -hmm. 
would that make life easier for you guys to, to have a line to follow, so to say, or and, and would it be possible to you know align with that particular rail or whatever yep. within a five centimeter yep. range? Absolutely, the answer is yes. Would it make our life easier? No, it makes no difference to us. It's a thing that we could absolutely exploit if it existed. the price of this technology is not very expensive so how much roughly do you think like for us to buy an autonomous car will be will that be cheaper than the current price of the cars in market okay so you're asking me whether I would like to add an enormous amazing thing and make the whole thing cheaper than what you pay okay um, <laughs> all right. uh, so the answer is I don't know because I don't know what the full system looks like yet um, I can tell you that I don't think it should kind of cost hundreds of thousands of pounds. And I, do, um, uh, I can tell you that certainly our aspiration and that of the people we frequently interact with in terms of the automotive industry is to be able to offer some sort of autonomy pack with, you know, at a price that is commensurate to what you would pay for some form of extra. Whether the price of the car goes down, I really can't tell you. But I suspect the price of your insurance will go down, which is another interesting thing. in terms of sound detection to ah. for, say, for instance, emergency vehicles. Yeah. So you have an advance warning. Uh, th that is an absolutely excellent question. And the answer is, up until everything that I've just shown you, nothing. But we have people who are now looking at this exactly, um, for exactly that reason. Yeah. Hi, here. Hey. As you said, the, the whole idea behind the, the paradigm is that you you guys are developing an algorithm that is learning by the experience of the user, right? So it's an ongoing process of learning mm -hmm. and improving the, the driving experience of mm -hmm. uh, each each turn. Mm -hmm. But as you as you also mentioned, it has a blind spot that it will base will basically be biased towards you know the ran, uh, the regular experiences of users, and it might be blind or short sighted for uh, rare events, uh, black mm -hmm. swans or tail effects. Okay. Uh, what what exactly has been uh, how is it going, the research on the topic of trying to anticipate or uh, how, how do you, how is it going, to, the, yeah, this research on how do you anticipate this kind of rare events? Do you think is it even possible to anticipate them and, or it will basically uh, just wait what happens and see how it goes? So that's a, that's a really good question. It's one of the reasons why perception is a hard thing because you have a long tail of perception where actually some things like, you know, will happen very, very rarely but they will really, really um, screw you, basically. Um, so statistically, yes, of course, you can build some sort of model and you can say, well, how often is that likely to happen? But the question is, in the actual event, how do you deal with it? Um, and so that kind of touches on the question that we, that we had earlier, when the vehicle decides that it doesn't know how to interpret a situation, um, how do you actually manage that handover properly? So you need some form of, of advanced warning. Um, and also, uh, it is again about getting to a place where you make sure that your vehicle has seen enough, that the technology has experienced enough to make fewer of the things that it sees these sort of black swan events. Does that make sense? So it's again about getting the technology out there and saying, you know what, if I could, and the safety argument again, right, if I could write down that on balance, I, I will see one catastrophic black swan event uh, once every, and I'm making up this number, you know, um, 10 to the 10 miles, um, and there's another interesting question here, what should that number be, right? Um, if I see one of those, uh, and if I can follow that up with a sentence that says, actually, um, a person, a human driver on balance, on average experiences one of those black swan events every 10 to the six miles, making up the number, right? Um, then I'm pretty sure that most insurance companies would say, oh, okay. So dealing with them is to do with experiencing the world, and trying to push that into some, some form of statistical insignificance, which is exactly the same argument that you would have to make around safety. Hello. Hey. Um, thanks for your presentation. So my question sort of builds on that a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the claims that's been made about autonomous vehicles is around environmental benefits, that there, there might be some opportunities there for us to reduce um, some of the environmental impacts of transport. And one way of doing that is for these shared to actually move away from an individual ownership model which is 
what's actually been spoken about quite a lot today in terms of the questions as well, if I own a car, what will happen? Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, from what you've said around the technology, learning from individuals and getting to know me and getting to know my behaviours, how might that technology work if we're then talking about a shared ownership where it would have to learn multiple different ways of driving or um, not, not shared ownership and just a variety of ways of getting through a different urban environment? Mm -hmm. um, so there's two answers to that. One is to say, well, actually, there is a way of... So if, say, you have a, a shared car scheme where you know, a bunch of people use the same car, like, for example, in your family, maybe, or you know, anything like that, um, figuring out who's in the driving seat and picking that particular profile is a thing. So that's one way of dealing with it. Um, another question is to say, uh, what if it's not actually a car, but it's like a people carrier, a people mover, like a, a bus, right? Um, and so don't get hung up on the fact that we can adapt to individual people's driving styles. Um, it does mean that we can pick such a thing as, for example, a representative driver that is approved by the bus company, say that actually has that profile running. Um, Hello, uh, hey. I'd like to make a question. Have you thought about using a thermal camera to identify humans even means mm -hmm. maybe burning things? Yes, so absolutely. So people have been done that sort of stuff, have been doing this sort of stuff for a while. Um, and uh, the use of these sort of sensors is, is, has, has been proposed pretty early on because it clearly makes a lot of sense. The problem that you will have is come back with, uh, is that like a, a car manufacturer will come back and say, this needs to fit, fit into my NCAP surround view system, making up the name, right? Um, which has these cameras in it. Uh, please make it work with that. Um, and there is, I think, only one, one company that I can think of right now that actually uses thermal imaging for this sort of stuff right now. So the answer is yes, but getting that into the market is a hard conversation to have. Um, and over to the right. So you mentioned um, shared learning experiences between different users. Uh, do you see any scope to go to a kind of real-time model of that where the cars might not just perceive each other but tell each other their intended paths and driving strategies? Totally. So I think um, there's a lot of conversation about whether you do all of that with onboard sensing, like what I've talked about, and that's certainly our baseline. Um, or whether you go down the you know, vehicle to infrastructure communication idea uh, route or the vehicle to vehicle communication route. Um, and it's very easy to fall into a camp and say, whoa, you know, it must be uh, onboard sensing only and no other vehicle to vehicle. Um, I think it's not particularly wise to go, it's one thing or the other, right? I think the technology that we develop is particularly geared towards being onboard sensing only because it takes us a hell of a long way and allows us to operate in things like warehouses, for example, right? Um, do I then say it would be dumb to uh, then also use vehicle to vehicle? Totally not. I mean, if it's a thing that is useful and if it's a thing, thing that exists, why not leverage it? It's the same with GPS, you know? I mean, so, so um, I've given a talk like this to like the geodesic society of, of, of Germany at some point who basically invent GPS, right? Um, and they came back and were like, oh, that was pretty GPS bashing. And the answer is actually, no, it's not. It just says that I don't want to be solely reliant on GPS. But of course, if a GPS signal is available to me and that has some quality and it feeds information in, then, oh my God, yes, I'll use it, but not solely. I'll fuse it into what my system does. And this is exactly the same sort of answer. So if you have an instrumented roundabout with a centralized management system, why not, why not exploit that? Sure. But when I don't, I still want to be able to be autonomous. Okay, we've got time for two more, so gentlemen here. And then Thanks for the presentation. So I would be very interested in uh, knowing your solution or technical or practical solution to this famous problem of when the car should basically choose, in case of a crash, mm -hmm. choose between the, you know, the driver or, or the, you know, the owner yep. or the regular person. Mm -hmm. So what would be the solution? Okay. Um, all right. So very common question. So. There is an analogy, so, so I'm going to paraphrase that a little bit and I'm going to get back to your question immediately, but you know, this is like this conversation about the, uh, the singularity when artificial intelligence takes over and you know, we all be enslaved. So in the context of that, what I just said, there is a very interesting quote that goes like this. The reason why I don't worry about the singularity, and personally I subscribe to this bit, the reason why I don't worry about the singularity is the same reason that I don't worry about overpopulation on Mars, okay? 
because clearly we're on our way to Mars. Clearly that is something we want to do. And clearly it is conceivable that at some point in the future when we've solved a bucket load of really hard technical problems, we will need to think about overpopulation on Mars. Okay? So um, we're kind of, we're kind of in, that, in, that, in that place. So how do I choose between the owner of the vehicle, like me, Mr. Wright, and the bus full of school children, right, for example? So um, I can have, it's pretty, it's pretty conceivable, pretty straightforward for our technology to separate between a car and a person and a bus. Right? I have no idea whether that bus is full of school children or empty. Um, and it's, it's not really clear whether the person that I'm seeing is like you know, an, an old lady or whatever. Right? Um, so making that sort of decision, the granularity of which that sort of decision is made that is often posed in these questions is one that is beyond what I would say right now the perception systems that we have in those vehicles very, very often. Okay? Um, that's one thing. The other thing is there's actually um, a very clear sort of calculus that insurance companies deploy where you could write down actually what are the relative costs, what are the relative risks, um, what is that sort of stuff. And I would expect that, that something in there will actually translate to that space. But is it that my system is loyal to me because it's mine as the driver? Not so much. Not so much. Is it that it will recognize that I would much rather hit the bus full of school children than you know the, the kind of one child that's running across the road? I don't really, I don't really think we're at that place yet. Um, if in doubt, personally, I'd probably go for the bus because it's big and heavy. Just saying. <laughs> and that is a thing we can encode. Okay, we've got time for one more quick question just here. Actually, that was uh, the question I was going to ask. <laughs> so, if anyone else has a question. <laughs> Just one more there, then. Uh, you spoke a little bit about uh, the automotive industry and how they're thinking um, about having shared kind of uh, a network effect of uh, the, the data that you would be coming out of a maybe car sale company with, uh, with a car. Um, can you speak a little bit more about that and how um, the privacy issues might come up and about having maybe shared routes and things like that? Mm -hmm. um, hmm. I don't really know how I would speak more about that because, because it's kind of, so privacy is clearly a, a thing, clearly a big deal. Um, it is clearly also a thing that, that service providers like that can solve because already we have systems vehicle, in vehicle systems that send a whole lot of telemetry about where you go back to, you know, the mothership somewhere and there it gets analyzed for whatever it is being a route predictance or whatever, right? You have the same issue with your phone, you have, you know, the same issue with all, all sorts of things arguably and the reality of the situation is that in some cases we don't care and in other cases we really care a lot but we for some reason choose to do it anyway uh, and in other cases actually the data is dealt with in a way that actually satisfies us. Uh, and I have to believe that, that this will be one of those, it, it will fall in one of those categories. There'll be some people who will choose not to do it. There'll be other people who will choose to do it even though their privacy is somehow violated. And that is a perfect, I'm not saying any of these is invalid, right? I'm just saying, I think these will be the categories of, of things that falls into. And there will be, um, I think a lot of, a lot of uh, research, certainly on the industrial side, how to make that a viable, non-concerning consumer product. But I think, to some degree, the pressure, the commercial pressure on the industrial side will help us solve that. Okay. To a degree that will satisfy a large proportion of the user base. So before we thank Ingmar, um, I just want to flag up, it's the last seminar of the term next Thursday, same time, and it's looking at how we predict um, emerging technologies and um, reductions in cost and, and progress. Um, that's with Don Farmer of INET. So do come along for that. Um, and so uh, on that note, let's thank Imar. I think that was a brilliant, brilliant seminar. <laughs>